But Leo, the market didn't crash. But it shouldn't stop you from making some killer trades. Some of your best trades when it comes to trading weekly options are going to come as a result of paying close attention to trading options, weekly options that is, on some particular stocks. Some of the trades where I show you where I go and I take 6K to, you know, 60K, uh, 4K to 140K, they derive from paying close attention to the behavior and characteristics and charts of a specific individual stock, not the indexes. And yes, there's plenty of uh, videos that I've posted on this channel where I trade S&P 500 futures, gold futures, and so on, guys. And the opportunity actually presented itself yesterday on gold futures, and damn right, we took advantage of it. And so this video is a quick review, guys, about how you could have easily profited if instead of focusing just on the S&P 500, where the overall theme from 13 market moves, based off some of the characteristics we've witnessed in the market, that S&P 500 had a great probability of making a move lower. So currently we're going from a clear overshoot above certain levels. That does not mean the market is not going to resolve into a severe drop as we predicted to 3400 level. It's just not happening quite yet. And for that reason, I'm actually going to post a documentary at the very end of this video. So if you guys are great students of the market, you're trying to learn more, pay close attention to what happened in the past in order to derive at some great trading decisions and ideas in the future. So with that said, Let's take a look at some trades. I know some of these trades, guys, may have been on your radar, but it's all about entries and exits. So early in the week, basically taking a trade here on VIAC when it was trading around the 45 level. Now, we actually bought 42 strike puts. At the time, they were going anywhere from 10, 20 cents. 10, you know, depending on what your entry level is, whether you were able to not knock out the black candle right here or whether you were getting on the cross right here. Anyways, your cost on the 42 strike puts would have been anywhere from 10 cents to 20 cents. And on the 42 strike, this stock dropped all the way to 41.06 uh, today. So that means your options were worth uh, about 90 cents to a dollar at one point today, which basically is a 5x trade. So you could focus on S&P 500, but guys, again, some of the greatest opportunities in the stock market they derive from identifying some specific patterns in some specific stocks and this is just a case of where we've alerted our pain members that hey this is an easy trade you could have taken like guys options were 10 20 cents damn it even if your account was a couple hundred bucks you could have taken it to from 200 to basically a thousand bucks if your account was at a thousand you could have taken a thousand to five grand just on this trade alone now, there's plenty of trades like that. Another one is FSLR. Okay, FSLR, we've sent an alert to short the hell out of this thing. And, you know, we've been super bullish on FSLR back in the days a few months ago when it was making a move from the 70s all the way to like 100. And now this is a chart for the last 10 days. So we've been short FSLR last week. We've been short FSLR this week. And again, it's all about your entries and exits. I had some guys that made 200% on this. I also had some guys that made as much as 450% on this trade. And basically, you would want to short it on the bounce. So short it on the bounce. If you're not familiar with that, you guys got to click the link below, schedule a 20-minute coaching call, and get a clear understanding. Of what the hell does it actually mean to short the bounce? So basically, it refers to your entry point and when the stock actually looks like it's making a bullish move. And most of the people, they get scared from initiating their short position uh, during such patterns uh, when it looks like, oh my God, we're, you know, we're clearly moving higher here, we're bouncing strong. That's where a lot of people actually close their short positions, which coincides with exact time and when people should be opening short positions. And so there's clear signs where you could be looking at uh, on shorter time frames that's actually going to predict the next move lower, such as in this case, when we recommended shorting FSLR on April the 6th. If you're a pain member, you would have gotten the alert. And if you took appropriate action, you would have actually been highly profitable because at some point today, uh, FSLR was trading as low as 78.56. Uh, so needless to say, if you were pulling the trigger right here, the options in the 81 strike were going for literally 30, 40 cents. You would have been able to cash out today at close to $3 a contract, which is about a 650 percent return guys so 
understand this just because the market is going sideways to higher it does not mean that certain sectors are not going to sell off and that's the puzzling thing to me because to me pulling the trigger and shorting stocks it's natural for me it's very simple but I know a lot of traders actually struggle with that but clearly if you look at this chart there's nothing bullish about it yes S&P 500 closed at all-time highs and that's why exactly I want you to stay till the end of this video and pay close attention to what happened in 1987 okay the market had similar circumstances as it is right now so the crash is coming okay maybe off in time in a little bit guys but damn it when it does happen it's going to be brutal it is going to be fucking brutal in the meantime you can take advantage of certain sectors like in this case fslr is actually everybody's favorite in the in, among analysts that is what the fuck do they know the damn analysts on wall street so fslr Actually, somebody on CNBC was talking just the other day how great of a stock FSLR was. Well, I wonder if they were adding on the dip today or if they were actually closing this position because it sold off. Pretty consistent pattern, guys. I mean, you can definitely learn it from this pattern that anytime the stock bounces, it drops. And the next morning, look, I mean, this is pretty fucking amazing. Like, it gaps down and sells off for the rest of the day. That's your move three. And remits it's the same thing. It gaps down, sells off, tries to bounce, sells off again, and closes lower. Unable to breach this gap basically communicates to you there's a, a lower move here. But beware at this point, you don't want to be getting in here on the put side. I mean, the stock can easily drop to 76. It could have done it today. But uh, your risk reward now to the downside after it's been dropping all the way from 90 since April 1st. I mean, it's just not good. You don't want to be taking a trade like that. But it's been a highly consistent trade, guys, and anybody could have taken that if you're paying attention to the right stuff. The earnings season is just around the corner, and in that particular instance, if you really want to make the use, the best use of the earnings season that's coming up, we have a course that's trade like a rock trade, straight devotion to identifying the best trading opportunities during the earnings season, understanding the correlations between certain sectors and certain stocks and how you can use that to your advantage. So if you have not taken Trade Like a Rockstar course, make sure you do that by clicking the link uh, somewhere below this video. Now, so FSLR, 450% guys, depending on your entries, quick and easy trade, regardless of what the hell the market is doing. Now, another trade that we actually uh, partaken in was FGEN. FGN guys you may be thinking hey I don't want to enter this fucking trade after it dropped so much but we did when the stock was right about 23 we bought 20 strike puts and needless to say at the point where we pulled the trigger that we're going for 50 cents guys I'm saying you don't have to have a lot of money in your account to take your account substantially high so the 20 strike puts in FG, FGN basically uh, did about 400% and FGN 20 strike when we were getting them they were about 40 50 cents and at some point they were going for as much as about uh, two dollars and uh, thirty two dollars and forty cents so uh, depending on exactly where you entered your trade it was an easy four five hundred percent or right there four hundred uh, fifty percent guys these trades all of these trades are happening while what's happening to the general market while the general market is going higher so maybe you're watching the free content here at 13 market moves but you're not catching trades like this and the exactly the reason why you're not catching trades like this is because you're not trading with me you're not trading with one of the coaches you're not getting uh, trade alerts from us and so you can easily do that uh, by signing up at the link below now some of the other trades that you can have easily partake in okay despite of a substantial uh, move higher for example yesterday right we were alerting our members to buy Amazon puts and you'd be like how the fuck would you be making money on Amazon puts well guys it's very simple yesterday Amazon bounces to a level of about 33.25 okay and we tell our members to buy some uh, puts uh, it bounces to uh, it drops it bounces promptly back to this 33.20 level it said buy puts well this morning at the market open the stock was trading down all the way to the 32.80s uh, it was in the 32.80s so that was a quick 40 uh, point drop which would have gotten you paid nicely depending on what strike price you used and yes we did convert into Amazon calls shortly after that uh, if you're a paying member, you would have gotten an alert from us to convert into Amazon calls, guys. With that said, some of the other trades that you could have easily partaken, 
if you're a part of our program, guys, uh, despite of you know how bullish the charts look, there is always something, guys, that's dropping. Understand this: the market never just goes straight higher. There's always opportunity to short something. I think that's where an average investor, a trader, they don't understand a lot of our short-term strategies, and partially that arrives that the predominant sentiment is you just want to buy and wait till stuff goes higher. Well. A lot of money is made exactly in the opposite side of the equation because generally stocks drop way faster than they climb higher. At this point, the market is so complacent that you really got to dig for specific stocks to find these opportunities. By the way, uh, our alert on um, Bitcoin, I posted the video on Bitcoin uh, uh, crash, Bitcoin drop. And so when we posted the video, uh, Bitcoin was trading... Okay, so we posted the video on April 5th, uh, basically uh, when Bitcoin is around uh, 59K, 58.8, when I posted the video. You had a great opportunity to short Bitcoin right here. It made the cross, it dropped all the way to 55.5 level. So that's a nice four or $5,000 move that you could have capitalized on on the short side. And uh, recently we've reversed our call on Bitcoin to the upside uh, because of the bullish cross. So in the prior video, I've shared, guys, with you a very simple strategy what to use in the moving averages. We use the number 13 and 55. They're both Fibonacci numbers. It helps you nail short-term moves in the directional uh, part of a particular stock, a commodity, or whatever it is you're trading. So start using those numbers, and you guys are going to nail a lot of entries and exits on this much more precisely. So... You could have definitely made some money on the drop in Bitcoin, but more importantly, you could have easily made a lot more on the drop of Tesla. And so we've posted the video again. When did we post the video? We posted the video right here on April 5th, which was a Sunday. And we've showed you a chart, um, a slightly different looking chart. We've basically pointed that when Tesla makes a black candle, it's going to drop. So it's a pop and drop. And we said, look, it could easily drop on Monday, but it could also just pop and then drop. So you had an amazing opportunity, guys. We specified a level in Tesla that it struggles with this level of 690, 700 level. Every time it gets close to it or just slightly above that, that's an awesome opportunity to short. And as you can see right here, I mean, it's a no-brainer, right? I mean, it gets to the 700 level here. Nice drop. It pops to 690. It drops. It pops just above the 700 level. You could have easily entered the puts that were described in the Sunday video right here on Tesla. Clearly, if you were bullish Tesla, you would have gotten killed. So please don't leave any stupid comments where you're like, oh yeah, I'm so bullish on Tesla. Come on, man. If you bought Tesla calls on the great news that was, you know, the general theme over the weekend, and you would have bought calls at the open on the first 30 minutes of the open on Monday, you would have gotten crashed on your calls. So the strategy is still to short the bounces in Tesla, guys. It bounces, it drops, it bounces, it drops, it bounces, it drops. And despite of how bullish the market has been pretty much throughout the week, it hasn't really moved, uh, you know, the first few days of the week, but the last couple of days, it's got a particular pattern it's developing where the market just pops in the last hour of the trading session. And despite of all this bullish momentum into the last hour of the trading session, Tesla is not moving. It, it's dead. Tesla is dead. It's temporarily dead. You don't want to be buying calls on this shit. Uh, you want to know and understand when are the appropriate entries to short it. And if you don't, and maybe you were one of those bulls that just kept buying it thinking, okay, we're above 700, we're only going higher, they delivered all these cars in China and blah, blah, blah. And you're just buying the story in the news, guys. You got killed. Don't repeat the same mistake again. Okay, make sure you take advantage of the 20-minute coaching call that we offer absolutely free. Click the link below and make sure you don't miss awesome entries like this because this was easy. Guys, I described it in the video on Sunday. I said it's likely to do what it just did right here. Look at the similarity of the pattern. It pops and it drops. It pops and it drops. Easy trade. Any one of you could have done it. So the question is, okay, how do you make money on shorting stocks? Utilizing weekly put options while the market consistently going higher. I just shown you like a shitload of stocks. Where you could have done it and it's not like the market moves 10 20 points okay and you can make a lot of money on being a bull there 
all right, you can make a ton of money. Why? Because in any equation, when you look from the perspective of how do you actually make money with anything? You got to buy low, you got to sell high. Well, when the market is so bullish, option premiums are deflating because the VIX is dropping and you can actually get some bargains on these put options. And the stocks, they don't have to make as big of a move in order for you to profit. So because generally like Tesla options, they would have been sky high, but the daily trading range in Tesla now has diminished. The VIX is going lower and the premiums in Tesla options on both sides, they're actually going lower. So it doesn't have to make as much of a move in order for you to make a pretty decent sized returns. And so in terms of VIAC, in terms of, hey, guys, the BABI made a killing today. I mean, still, like, you know, some of you were questioning my call on BABI. I said this is a highly bearish pattern. Like, guys, uh, what's bullish about this shit? There's nothing bullish here. Okay, China stocks are dead beats right now. You want to bet against them. Uh, you know, it doesn't matter how bullish overall index is. There's always some great opportunities on the short side. And so, you know, if you're just being bullish right now because the general market is bullish, you're missing out a ton of opportunity because of the fact that everybody is bullish, the way the options are priced, uh, they're priced, the upside or the call side is priced slightly higher than the downside. But because overall, the size in the moves is diminished, both sides options uh, are really on the price right now historically. So there's two ways to make money in the market. And that is you can expect a super large move to the upside or the downside. Okay. And if everybody's expecting a large move to the upside or the downside, the options are going to be priced accordingly. So meaning you're going to be paying a high premium for those options. So if you're correct in the huge size of the move, yes, you're going to make money, but your profits are going to be limited because again, the way you collect this 4X, 5X, 7X type gains, it's all a relationship between how much you pay for the option in relation to how much you're selling it. So if you're paying 10 bucks for the option and you're selling it, you know, for 40 bucks, okay, that's a 4X trade. But if you're paying, you know, five bucks for the option and now you're selling it for 30, okay, I mean, that's a 6X trade. So sometimes you're options your, your option trades they will make you more money when the vix is actually going down because the cost of option is decreased drastically from what you would normally pay for it and in that case the stock doesn't even need to make that big of a move the market does not need to make that big of a move in order for you to put together a four or five x or six x trade so if you have any questions about it, guys, bottom line, it's it's always about your entries and exits. It's always about how much you pay for the option in relation to how much you're selling it for. And the reason a lot of traders don't get traction because they're trying to buy these options that expire in a month, that expire in six months. Guys, you don't have to be a fucking rocket scientist to say, well, I think something's going to go higher in the next six months or something's going to go lower in the next six months. The issue with that is this is you're not going to make any fucking money because most of the traders, they underestimate the very fact that for quite some time, the market is not going anywhere. It's just going sideways. It's going up one day. It's going down the next day. And most of the traders, they just, for whatever reason, they are only able to see the perspective of the market moving higher. And that's why they don't gain any serious momentum. For every time you would have bought calls on BABA here, you would have lost your ass because probably it goes lower. And then even if you bought the dip right here, you would have still lost your ass. But look how beautiful this downside is on the chart of BABA. And once it gets going to the downside, the notable part about it, it doesn't stop. In other words, in order for you to profit substantially from weekly options, you need a move in the same direction for a number of days. And so in this particular case, it, it moves lower yesterday and it continues to move lower altogether. I mean, it's a 10 point move in a stock where the options are pretty damn cheap. And so, you know, putting together two, 300% return on weekly options utilizing the chart like this, you know, consecutively back to back, it's a no brainer. So, but if you looking at this and you're like, man, I don't know how the hell you look at this chart, how you calculate this, 
guys, that, that just tells you and it tells me that you need to learn more in order to advance your trading skills further. So with that said, guys, it's not just about where the market is now. The way you make the money is by identifying what's actually happening next. And sometimes identifying certain sectors and certain individual stocks, that's the part that will get you paid substantially higher than just trading the SPY or the S&P puts or calls or whatever that is that you're focused on. So if you'd like to get more information on that, make sure you click the link below. And now with the point in the video where I hopefully I brought some light of how do we actually make money here at 13 market moves while the market overall is trending higher, but we're able to find these crazy opportunities, which are not like, we're not making like 10, 20%. These are 300, 400, 500% returns on betting against the stock market, basically, in the right sectors that produces these phenomenal opportunities that the bulls can't even visualize in their wildest dreams. So with that said, learn more about how to short stocks utilizing weekly options at 13marketmoves.com. And now I'm going to show you the video, a documentary, guys, uh, that I was able to find back from 1987. Uh, and it's a really nice piece, so I hope you enjoy it, taking you back into the bull market in the 80s where nobody suspected that the crash was just around the corner based on how bullish the conditions are. And since today, everybody in the general media is talking about the new highs in the market and how we're over 4,000 on S&P 500, I want to bring this light and make sure that you see the opposite side of the equation because every new market high ultimately resolves in a substantial drop and the higher the market goes without a substantial correction the bigger that correction becomes so hopefully you enjoy this documentary piece right here uh, leave a like if you want me to post some more stuff like this um, I hope you guys have a great weekend by the way do not miss out the next video uh, one of our students just took 8k to 150k uh, in just a week of trading so make sure you don't miss out that next uh, interview with uh, uh, a 13 market move student guys uh, for now enjoy this documentary piece I'll catch you guys on the next trade soon let's roll or as others claim will it prove to be a positive disciplining of Iran and seen at six we'll look at both arguments We'll also assess the impact of today's swan dive by the Dow Jones Industrial Average. All tonight on the Phoenix Six. The making of a millionaire tonight on the scene at Six. Black Monday, the worst day ever on Wall Street. The Dow Jones lost 508 points in one day, more than 20%, all the way down to 1,738 and more than 600 million shares were traded. NBC Nightly News with Tom Brokaw. Good evening. It is a day that will be in bold print in history books. Black Monday, October 19th, 1987, when the stock market went into a free fall, losing more in one day than it did on Black Tuesday in 1929. And while conditions are much stronger now than they were then, today's precipitous plunge struck fear in the hearts and pocketbooks of even Wall Street veterans. As NBC's Mike Jensen reports tonight, it was a day of carnage in the trading rooms. In trading rooms on Wall Street, there was panic. Sell orders flooded in from big institutional investors, from private investors, from mutual funds. Worried about inflation, rising interest rates, a declining dollar, and huge budget and trade deficits. And all of them afraid the markets would plunge even more. Stocks also plummeted overseas, and the price of gold skyrocketed, as it generally does when there's a crisis. Outside the New York Stock Exchange, What's a sense like of there? disbelief. Panic, complete panic. Everyone's going crazy. What's going to happen to the country if it does crash? Five years ago, when the bull market began, the Dow stood at 776. It rose steadily, peaking at 2722 two months ago. Then, in the last two weeks, a collapse. The Dow losing more than 860 points in just five trading days during that period, wiping out more than 30% of the gains from the entire five-year bull market, 
more than half of that in one day. New York Stock Exchange Chairman John Phelan tried to be reassuring. We don't know where this market will, will end up, but I think that we are extremely fortunate today that the country is in a very strong position and we're not going through a period of hyperinflation or the tail end of hyperinflation. But stockbrokers like George Comas of Merrill Lynch were bombarded with sell orders from their customers. Jeffrey, uh, not a good day. By the end of the day, the brokers were drained. Yeah, give me a little water and a couple of asking things. I feel like you're using it. And it wasn't just the stockbrokers who had a bad day. It's going to affect my pocket, but it's going to affect everyone else's pocketbook. And I think the uh, consumer will hold back. What concerns many experts now is the psychology of all this. That the stock market panic will affect people who don't even own stocks. Make them fearful of borrowing, for example, to buy a new car or a home because they fear a recession. That could slow down the economy and lead to a recession. A week ago, most economists were saying the stock market decline was merely a correction, a downward tick in an upward market. But today's plunge was so huge, so shocking, that no economist, no Wall Street analyst was willing to predict where it would end. Mike Jensen, NBC News, New York. Almost every stock took a hit today, but some of America's best-known companies were among the biggest losers. Digital, the computer and electronic giant, was down 42 and a quarter. CBS, which had been shooting up, lost 42 and an eighth today. IBM, the bluest of the blue chips, off 32 points today. General Motors was down 12 and a half points. AT&T, another investor favorite, off six and a quarter today. A man who's had a very busy day is the chairman of the New York Stock Exchange, John Phelan, who's with us now on the street. Phelan, some people have recommended that you delay opening tomorrow to give the stock market and the investors a chance to catch their breath, to catch up with the psychology of all of this. Have you considered that? Well, we have considered it, and I think right now we are really thinking of opening 9.30 as usual because it seems, doesn't seem to mean very much whether we open at 9.30 and 10, 10.30 in the morning. People should know what they were wanting to do. They should be over the initial shock of what's happened and hopefully they can view things in a sane and dispassionate point of view. There are also people who say that we should now make illegal the so-called index trading where big computers just automatically trigger the sale of some stocks when they get to a certain level. Would you be in favor of that? Well, I'm not sure that you should ban them because they've become a valuable tool for institutions, but clearly after the last two weeks, not necessarily today, but over the last two weeks, a re-examination of that product, how it's used, and what kinds of money and margin are needed for that and position limits are needed for that will certainly be under review. Any forecast, Mr. Phelan, on what is likely to happen tomorrow after this crazy day today? Well, I'm like everybody else in America. I'm praying for an up day, not a down one. But you have no real reason to expect it can go one way or the other? No, it's very difficult at this point in time to tell. Thank you very much. John Phelan, who's the chairman of the New York Stock Exchange. Thank you. A number of factors contributed to today's record loss, and no one was blaming any one development for setting off the selling binge. By day's end, however, everyone was looking to Washington for some action. But as NBC's Andrea Mitchell reports now, there was confusion there as well. The president tried to ignore the market's plunge, continuing to brag about what Republicans like to call the Reagan recovery. This month will set a record, the longest peacetime economic expansion on record. On paper, the economy looks good. The leading indicators are sending a message. Steady as she goes. But the markets were anything but steady. When its panic took hold on Wall Street, the administration tried to blame Congress for scaring big business by proposing higher taxes. Just yesterday, Treasury Secretary Baker made that point. Well, I think that the, that the writing of these tax packages had, an, had a, a major effect in what's happened to the stock market over the, over the course of the past three or four days. I think that's uh, an outrageous charge. Uh, what the financial markets want to see is someone seriously addressing cutting this deficit. Gridlock over the deficit. One reason investors are worried. Big deficits can help push up interest rates. Higher interest rates mean higher inflation, undermining the economy, scaring investors. Unless the president pulls his administration and the congressional leadership together in a desperately needed compromise on the budget, we're going to see more of the kind of instability that we've seen these last three weeks. Next, the other deficit in foreign trade. The huge gap between exports and imports did narrow last month, 
but the improvement was not as big as expected. Another disappointment to an already nervous market. Third, nervousness over recent hints by the Treasury Secretary that the administration might want the dollar to fall further. Critics say Baker helped spook the market. Particularly statements attributed to the Secretary of Treasury, Jenny Baker, that the United States will not defend the agreement that it made to stabilize the dollar and uh, uh, exchange rates around the world. By the end of the day, a nervous White House sent the president out with soothing words. I don't think anyone should panic because these... All the economic indicators are solid. The president is putting up a good front, but White House officials say they are as worried about what's happening as everyone else, and just as confused. Andrea Mitchell, NBC News, at the White House. A man who has been in the middle of the market and government policy is Donald Reagan, former head of Merrill Lynch, former Secretary of the Treasury, and former White House Chief of Staff. Mr. Reagan, uh, Mr. Baker, who is your successor, I'm told, had a three-hour meeting this afternoon with Chancellor Kohl of West Germany, supposedly to assure him that the American dollar would not go into a free fall. Do you think that that will help? Well, that's uh, one thing that might help. I think, actually, what we should be doing now is, is thinking in terms of supporting the dollar, in terms of loosening money, in terms of trying to preserve the economy. The stock market is a leading indicator. It foretells what might happen, not necessarily what will happen. And as a result, unless we do something quickly, uh, we could lose our economy, too. Mr. Reagan, as you know, President Reagan, as we just saw today, is optimistic generally about economic conditions. Do you think, as his former advisor, that the time now is for him to call everyone into one room and do something about it? I most certainly would uh, advise that at this time. I think there are many things that can be done. We've got to work on those twin deficits, both the trade and the budget deficit. We've got to work on loosening money. We've got to work on some of the things that are happening in the exchanges themselves. I, for one, think there should be an end to this program trading. And, Mr. Reagan, finally, what about those people out there who just have money in a CD or in a bank account, the uh, so-called small saver? Should they be worried tonight about what may happen to their savings? No, they shouldn't worry about their savings at all. They are protected. But I think what they should worry about and be concerned about is whether or not uh, this government is going to work hard enough to keep the economy going for another year or two. Thank you very much, Donald Regan, who is now a consultant to the NBC News business program for four hours. Thank you for being with us tonight. Good time. I'll have more on this important story, including an analysis of what it could mean for the rest of the economy later in the program. And coming up next, the other big story of this day, the U.S. attack on Iranian positions in the Persian Gulf. Where does it hurt? Here, for indigestion, heartburn, and gas, nobody does as much as Maalox Plus. Dose for dose, it neutralizes more than any regular strength and acid. And dissolves gas. Nobody does as much as Maalox Plus. These days, to have information bouncing off a satellite is not exactly front page news. But when it's headlines and pictures, all scores and stock prices, that is news. And it's all going from a Contel satellite to nationwide printing plants. On time, every time. If you have news to get out, Contel can help you too. For Contel, I'm John Ness. This is Brother Rice. He hasn't spoken a word in exactly 20 years. Now that's something to celebrate, but not a loud, boisterous celebration. More like this, the new FPD celebrate bouquet. Flowers, colorful bowl, and a fun box of surprises. So, when someone you know has done something worth celebrating, send the FPD celebrate bouquet. <laughs> A fun, inexpensive celebration worth shouting about, right? The new FTD Celebrate Bouquet. A great way to celebrate anything. Pasta salad. Well, nothing new about that. Until you add my favorite pitted prunes. So sweet. They're rounder, plumper shaped. Makes them a great compliment to any salad. And the sun sweet taste? That's the best compliment of all. U.S. warships destroyed two Iranian oil platforms in the Persian Gulf today in what President Reagan called a prudent yet restrained response to that Iranian missile attack last week on an oil tanker flying the American flag. NBC News Pentagon correspondent Fred Francis has more tonight. It was called Operation Nimble Archer. The Iranian oil rig was the target for 1,065 high-explosive shells during the 85-minute bombardment from four Navy destroyers. It was 1.40 in the afternoon in the Persian Gulf when as many as 30 Iranian soldiers heard a terse warning from the USS Thatch. 
This is the U.S. Navy. We will commence firing on your position at 1,400 hours. You have 20 minutes to evacuate the platform. End quote. Some men did evacuate, but at one point during the intense shelling from 5-inch guns like these, an Iranian radioed a plea to the Navy to stop firing so that wounded could be removed. The Navy ignored the plea. Defense Secretary Weinberger called the small oil rig the most appropriate military target for U.S. retaliation. This platform uh, had been uh, used to mount radar surveillance, uh, to report on convoy movements, to launch small boat attacks against non-belligerent shipping in the central Gulf waters, and uh, last week to fire at U.S. military helicopters. The Pentagon said another oil platform was also evacuated during the shelling. Navy SEALs boarded it and blew up radar and radio equipment. The oil platforms may have been an irritant to the Naval Task Force, but Pentagon sources say they were the least significant of all possible targets considered. The Pentagon decided against destroying the Silkworm missile sites along the Strait of Hormuz and the Fall Peninsula, or Revolutionary Guard bases on three islands, and striking the bases at Bandar Abbas and Bushir were ruled out as too provocative. Uh, hitting a more valuable target, like the missile bases or an airfield, would send a very nervous signal to our allies and to the Arab Gulf countries who've been supportive of what we're doing. But several Pentagon sources said today that policy of restrained response may be cast aside if Iran strikes back. One senior official said, we get more bang for our buck by hitting bigger targets, and we've told Iran just that meaning the United States is prepared for a counterattack and, if necessary, a wider war. Fred Francis, NBC News, the Pentagon. Iran threatened a crushing blow in retaliation for the latest U.S. attack. The warning was broadcast on Tehran television. The Iranians said that President Reagan committed a big mistake and definitely increased his problems. That warning was also sounded at the United Nations today by the ambassador there. We condemn all these acts of aggression launched by the United States that has opened an all-out war against my country. President Reagan said he had no desire for a military confrontation with Iran, but Iran should be under no illusion, he said, about U.S. determination. There was broad bipartisan support for the limited attack today, but as NBC's Chris Wallace reports tonight from the White House, the president sought to defuse fears of a major escalation. The president today flatly denied he's now in a war in the Persian Gulf. No, we're not going to have a war with Iran. They're not that stupid. But behind the bravado, there was growing concern that the U.S. is now a full-fledged combatant. Vice President Bush said no one thinks today's retaliation will stop Iran. And I hope that uh, it can remain irrational or on something. You think you will get the message, given the past performance? I wouldn't count on it, though. But we're not saying he got the wrong message. It's not anything better. And from the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, a pessimistic prediction. And let me stress for you that our commitment there is not going to be risk-free or casualty-free. I predict some more trauma. The administration talked very differently when it approved the reflagging operation last spring. Officials say the president was told Iranian attacks were not a major risk. Defense Secretary Weinberger made the same case in public. Since Iran, I'm sure, uh, uh, would not want to take the consequences, I'm sure that they themselves will be very much more cautious. Now experts say the U.S. has been sucked into the Gulf War and that force won't stop Iranian revolutionaries. It is very unlikely that confrontation, humiliation, making them feel weak is ultimately going to push them to a negotiating position. On Capitol Hill, there was broad support for today's raid as a necessary response. But there were disagreements. Some criticized the president for refusing to invoke the War Powers Act and get congressional approval. We don't want to see ourselves drifting into another Vietnam situation where uh, national leadership gets us into this and the American people don't really feel good about supporting it. And if the Democrats don't want us in over there, all they have to do is pass a resolution today asking us to dis discontinue our effort. And I think you would find the American people would disapprove of that kind of action. Most of all, there was a sense that U.S. involvement in the Gulf has reached a new stage. The point is, we are there. You may not feel us being there, but we are there. Now we can't tuck tail and run. And that may be the most important development today. Both supporters and critics of the Reagan policy agree. 
But the president has made such a commitment in the Gulf, there is no way he can get out now. Chris Wallace, NBC News, at the White House. Japanese Prime Minister Nakasone today chose former Finance Minister Noboru Takashita as his successor. Nakasone said that he picked Takashita because Japan needs to concentrate on internal economic reform and not be so dependent on foreign trade. Takashita will take office early next month. If you bought a new car from Ford Motor Company in 1981, good. Because surveys show, on average, our 81s have had fewer reported problems all through the years. And the 81s you could have bought from any other U.S. car maker. That's also true of our 82s. 3s, 4s, 5s, 6s, and 87s. With quality like that, whose 87s would you rather be driving in 1994? And that's quality is top one. Kellogg's new Trippic blends the goodness of wheat, corn, barley, and oat brands in dark, hearty flakes. With almond covered raisins and almond slivers. Promises are easy to make, but when you're selling your house, you want more than promises. And that's why Coldwell Banker is introducing the best-selling marketing services guarantee. It's our exclusive written guarantee that says we'll do everything we promise to do to sell your house, or you can do this to your listing contract. But we're confident you won't. After all, we're Coldwell Banker. Expect the best. We guarantee it. Remember the Sears Financial Network. It is six months in jail for Bernard Getz, the man who came to be known as New York City's subway gunman. He was sentenced on the single conviction in the case that was possession of an unlicensed handgun. He had been acquitted of more serious charges in the shooting of four young black men in a subway in 1984. In addition to the six months in jail, Getz was sentenced to five years on probation, a $5,000 fine, and 280 hours of community service. He was also ordered to undergo a psychiatric examination. Nancy Reagan was described today as feeling just great as she recuperates from surgery to remove her left breast. The presidential physician said the tests show no spread of the malignancy and the chances are excellent for her full recovery. The First Lady had another visit today from President Reagan late this afternoon. It is his fourth visit since the Saturday operation. Jessica McClure, a toddler who spent two and a half days on a Texas well, continues to improve as well. A surgeon cut away some dead tissue from her right foot today. That foot had been wedged against the wall of the well. The surgeon said that he would test the foot again on Wednesday, but he is optimistic that it can be saved. And baby Paul Holt, the youngest person ever to undergo a heart transplant, continues to recuperate. Hospital officials in Loma Linda, California, said the child, born Friday, is moving his legs, hands, and fingers. He shows no signs of deterioration in his health. You know, doing the right thing isn't always a matter of what you do. It's sometimes what you don't do. Now, when you eat Quaker oats for breakfast, what you don't do is fill up on bacon and eggs. So you don't get too much cholesterol or fat. Now, the doctors are saying that if you'll eat sensible, that's low fat, low cholesterol, that oatmeal can even help bring your cholesterol down. Hear what I said? Quaker oats. It's the right thing to do. Celebrate the end of daylight savings, Phillips is having a light bulb sell-a-thon. No one else has ever done this before. Right now, ooh, the participating stores have Phillips Logger Light Bulbs as big savings. Value, savings, convenience. Oh, so remember, it's almost time to change your clock back. Uh-oh. And it's time to change your bulb during Phillips Daylight Savings Savings. Ow! Oh. What a party! <laughs> Imagine it's lunchtime. That's time for a change of pace at Red Lobster. Make your pop, pop. With 
luscious lunch specials most under $4.99. And served in 15 minutes guaranteed or it's free. Make a flip with everything you like you've never known. A shrimp salad sandwich, seafood pasta, or today's fresh catch, red lobster for lunch. We know how you love seafood. Try our new lunch shrimp trio, just $3.95. Ironically, on this Black Monday on the Stock Exchange, there were a couple of big, big winners. A Pennsylvania couple holding the winning ticket in that state's record lottery, $46 million. As NBC's Cassandra Clayton reports tonight, Donald Loomer and Linda Desperate used their birth dates and other random numbers to come up with a big payoff. They arrived in the style to which they are quickly becoming accustomed. 55-year-old Donald Loomer and 37-year-old Linda Desperate. $46 million richer today. The couple lives together. He's a self-employed plasterer. She's a bookkeeper. Loomer says he buys $25 worth of tickets every week. He bought the big winner on October 13th, Despot's birthday. So, uh, they had one candle in the cake, and I blew it out, and I said, I guess everybody knows what I just wished, and everyone laughed. The wish came true, and today they picked up their first of 26 yearly checks a cool $1.4 million after taxes. In their hometown, Hollidaysburg, a small town in central Pennsylvania, the folks took pleasure in their neighbor's good fortune. He went for coffee and donuts in the morning. I guess he won't come back for coffee and donuts, probably. Oh, yeah, for all Friday. Before turning in the wedding ticket, the couple got a lawyer. One legal problem ahead, Donald Loomer hasn't divorced his estranged wife yet and she may be entitled to a share of the death pot. Is she going to be taking part of this uh, wedding? I imagine so. <laughs> <laughs> With what's left of the money, Wilbur and Despot hope to take a few trips to Hawaii, perhaps, and to the altar. Cassandra Clayton, NBC News, Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. Some other encouraging news for us, 2,800 striking NBC technicians and editors voted 2 to 1 today to accept the network's contract offer. But the strike, which is now in its 17th week, has not yet ended because two small units, representing about 50 members, rejected their offers. Navy officials said they would try to work out a solution. <laughs> This is the car that not only represents full-size luxury, but Ford's commitment to continuous improvement. This is the latest edition of the Ford LTD Crown Victoria. Have you driven a Ford <laughs> Don't come too close. I have a bad cough and a cold. No one appreciates the way Mom takes care of everyone <laughs> until Mom gets sick. What do we do now? Mom always takes care of us. That's when the person who doctors <laughs> the family turns to Robitussin because more doctors and pharmacists recommend Robitussin than any other cough medicine. Feeling better, Mom? I was. Robitussin, recommended by more doctors, pharmacists, and Dr. Mom. I'm Jane Pauley. Tomorrow morning on today, the latest on the Persian Gulf. I'm Maria Shriver, also Christopher Lambert and George Harrison. That's tomorrow morning on today. Today, Alan and Anna bought their first Maytag and will give it a spin for the first time. Pretty soon, they'll see more lace and frills than they bargained for. They'll wash away the muddy blues, and before they know it, they'll be knee-deep in Camp Pocahontas and Team Spirit. In fact, through the years, there'll probably be only one thing that family and their Maytag won't see a lot of. Me. Maytag. The dependability people. To recap the big story of the day, it was Black Monday, the worst day ever on the New York Stock Exchange. The market lost 508 points, more than 20%, and the final figures won't be available until tomorrow because of the crush of trading. Now the question is, how will this affect the rest of the economy? Alan Sinai is one of Wall Street's most respected economic forecasters. He's with Shearson Lehman, and he's with us tonight. Could this trigger a recession? Yes, it could. Uh, it is. Uh, the stock market has always been a predictor of recession. It does pretty well on that. It has only missed a couple of times in the 1960s, so the answer is yes, uh, it could. 
And what parts of the economy tonight are most at risk in your judgment? Well, if the stock market stays as low as it is now, uh, then uh, we are going to have impacts on consumer spending, certainly on housing, because the main problem is a big loss in net worth and wealth of, of many Americans, and also in the retirement monies that have been heavily invested in the stock market. Uh, we would also see some uh, effect on confidence, uh, but big ticket items would suffer the most, uh, and uh, later on, uh, the business sector and business capital spending. A lot of retailers out there tonight are looking at the Thanksgiving and Christmas shopping season, wondering what will happen to them. Well, I think that was going to be soft anyway. Uh, certainly, this uh, incredible decline is, uh, makes the prospects for the Christmas season a lot less uh, cheery. How are you feeling about tomorrow? Well, I actually think tomorrow we'll have a better day uh, on the stock market, but it will be a long time before we can erase uh, those uh, huge losses that we've had since August, not alone just today. Thank you very much, Alan Sinai, who is, the, as I say, the chief economic forecaster for Shearson American Express. That is Nightly News for this Black Monday night. I'm Tom Brokaw. I'll be back tonight at 11.30, 10.30 Central Time for a special report on this day and what it may mean for the future.